Thank you very much for your, for your patience. This year we've been teaching online and next year we have to do hybrid teaching and you can see why I'm really scared about hybrid teaching with this kind of problem, you know. Anyhow, so it's my great pleasure to welcome you all here. Dear Archbishop Musa, President of the Lutheran World Federation, dear members of the Lutheran World Federation official delegation, dear representatives of the German National Committee of the United Evangelical Lutheran Church in Germany, your excellencies, your graces, distinguished guests, everyone here, you are very welcome this evening. As Vice Rector of the Pontifical University of St. Thomas, the building where we are here, I'm very pleased to welcome all of you. Our university is known for its ecumenical commitment. It recently founded the Institute for Ecumenical Studies, which has Father Iasant as its director and Father Uzma Gomez helping him. And it is building on a long tradition of ecumenical thought and teaching in the Dominican order, illustrated by key figures such as Yves Congar, Jean-Jérôme Hammer, Hervé Lagrand, and Jean-Marie Tillard, to whom is dedicated the Tillard Chair of the Angelicum. And I would just make a little personal aside at this point, because as you know, I come from Britain, you can hear my accent, and for us, it's very normal to make jokes in a speech, probably because we are tense and it makes us feel less tense. So my funny little personal story here is a couple of times when I met Jean-Marie Thiard. Maybe others of you here know him. Uh, I was a student in Cambridge and the Dominican friars there used to have lay people living with them in their community. So we were all together with them in the, in the one community. There was five of us and about five of them as well. And Jean-Marie Thiard came a couple of times while I was there. And one of the times he came, uh, his door was opposite mine. There was a short, very narrow corridor. And my door was that side and his door was the other side. Okay. And he had obviously decided he was gonna make a big joke about this. So the first, morning after he had arrived, so we'd had one night, and I remember the night before, it was very windy and rainy, and we didn't have very good windows, and we didn't have a very good heating system, and he had a, a special little heater in his room with a little pilot light, and my guess what happened is that there was a big gust of wind, it probably shook the windows, came through and blew out the pilot light in his little heater, something like this happened. Anyway, the following morning, he walks down into the refectory and he announces in front of everybody, Ellen, you came into my room last night. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, now luckily I thought it was really funny and so did everybody else because, <laughs> because he knew what our British sense of humor was, but you can imagine that might not have gone so well, you know, in, in some places. <laughs> And, um, and he did a few other jokes, but I will, I will spare you those. So that's the end of my little personal story. <clears throat> to come back to our official uh, in introduction. In the 2021-2022 cycle of conferences, uh, we have a special topic on synodality. Walking together, synodality and Christian unity. And obviously this topic has been chosen as a contribution in view of the 2023 Synod of Bishops on synodality. So far, we have been honored to hear theologians from different Christian traditions, such as the Armenian Bishop Barsamian, the Waldensia moderator Alessandro Trotta, His Grace Rowan Williams, and Archbishop Giacomo Morandi, Secretary of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. This evening, we are honored to receive Reverend Dr. Martin Junger, who will speak about synodality from a Lutheran perspective, and Father Uzma Gomez will introduce him more formally. So it just remains for me to finish these comments. In synodality, we walk together, and ecumenism too is a process of walking together, sin, 
Hodos. We are pleased to have all of you with us in our common journey, convinced that Christ is always with us and in front of us, by our side and leading us on. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to introduce our guest of this evening. I will describe him as a devout Lutheran, a convinced ecumenist, a Christian leader of our time. Reverend Dr. Martin Junge is originally from Concepcion, Chile, from the Global South. He studied theology in Göttingen, Germany, served as president of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Chile, and served also as Lutheran World Federation Area Secretary for Latin America and the Caribbean Department for Mission and Development. Dr. Junge was elected as General Secretary of the Lutheran World Federation in 2009. He is the first Latin American to hold this office. He has served in this position for the last 11 years. And under his leadership, the Lutheran World Federation prepared programs and activities to commemorate the 500th anniversary of the Lutheran Reformation. The pledge to approach the anniversary in a spirit of ecumenical accountability has led to the adoption of the Catholic Lutheran Report from Conflict to Communion, the joint Catholic Lutheran commemoration of the Reformation in Lund and Malmö, Sweden, involving Pope Francis and the Lutheran World Federation leaders as co-hosts of the commemoration, initiation of the International Lutheran Pentecostal Theological Dialogue, and also a process within the Anglican Communion and the World Communion of Reformed Churches to adhere to the joint declaration of the Doctrine of Justification signed in 1999 between the Catholic Church and the Lutheran World Federation. Reverend Junge has written many articles, included in books and magazines, covering items of mission, advocacy, and ecumenism. I must say that he is a recognized preacher a public speaker and has been awarded with various honorary degrees and international prizes. Reverend Martin Junge and his wife Marietta Rulan had two children and we are really happy that she is with us this afternoon. Dr. Junge, we are delighted that you have accepted to prolong your stay in Rome to give a lecture on a topic which is at the center of the current reflections of the Catholic Church. To you and to all those who are following us in streaming, I am very pleased to leave you with a devout Lutheran, a convinced ecumenist, a Christian leader of our time, Reverend Dr. Martin Junge. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you for this warm welcome and uh, for a good joke. Uh, it's good to start like this. Gracias, Usman, for tu palabras. I want to begin with a profound uh, thanks for this invitation to speak with you today. Thank you to Father Destivel for, and the Institute for Ecumenical Studies, as well as to the entire Pontifical University of San Tomas Aquinas Angelicum. Your commitment to the journey, to the ecumenical way, has inspired and continues to inspire all of us 
in our different churches. I praise God for the life of Father Jean-Marie Tillard, to whom this lecture series and chair are dedicated. His own commitment to the gospel as a way of communion has opened many doors. I also wish to thank the ecumenist who inaugurated the chair, Cardinal Walter Kasper. I can speak personally that his witness has deeply impacted Lutherans around the world and encouraged us on the journey from conflict to communion. Cardinal Kaspar was among the signatories of the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification in 1999, a landmark ecumenical agreement of the 20th century, and which today brings together five world communions, Reformed, Anglican, Methodist, Catholic, and Lutheran, in an ongoing witness together to the mercy of God in proclamation and in service to the world. I would like to acknowledge the presence of Archbishop Ian Ernest, of the Anglican Communion, and the Reverend Matthew Lafferty of the World Methodist Council. As we were greeting each other just a few minutes ago, I was just saying that I believe we are still trying to unpack and to grasp what God has done in our midst, bringing together five global communions around the doctrine of justification, committing ourselves to strong witness, to share a word of grace in this world where so much disgrace is unfolding. And we encouraged each other that we will be courageous in unpacking, grasping what God has done and continues to do among ourselves. And I want us to invite each other that we do that with hope and with joy. Thank you for your presence. Thank you to all of you for your presence and engagement in this topic. Synodality has never been absent in the life of the church though at times more hidden than instrumental. It has played a role in the life of many faith communities, whether on a local or broader level, as they discern what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Today, synodality has been given a new perspective and role. It is now a question that challenges each one of us not only in our spiritual life, but in the life of our ecclesial institutions and the ways in which we define and use authority and power. It challenges, challenges us to think about the foundation of our faith and how that foundation, that touchstone, so to speak, becomes visible, more visible, for all people to see and to believe. This new role and attention that synodality has acquired in our day is in large part due to His Holiness, Pope Francis. From the many encounters with Pope Francis, there will be always two words that I will remember. Pray for me and caminare insieme. Let's walk journey together. Pope Francis is concerned to embody the insights of Vatican II, to give them real life, a specific form in this third millennium. As many of the well-known lecturers in this series have already pointed out, for Pope Francis, synodality means, I quote, to walk together is the constitutive way of the church, the figure that enables us to interpret reality with the eyes and the heart of God, the condition for following the Lord Jesus and being servants of life in this wounded time, I end quote. In walking together, caminar insieme, we are able to understand and interpret with God's immeasurable goodness the realities that surround us. We are able to be disciples, followers of Jesus, that is, those who seek life abundant for the whole human family. 
For Pope Francis, the synodal church has four essential characteristics that mark ecclesial life. I quote, listening to the apostles' teaching first. Second, the safeguarding of mutual communion. Third, the breaking of the bread. And fourth, prayer, end of quote. He then defines these further as preaching and catechesis, grounded in God's word as community or communions that, I quote, shields us from selfishness and particularisms, end of quote, as the breaking of bread, recognizing that Christ walks with us and prayer. It is no wonder that the ecumenical movement is revived and reinvigorated by such a vision, these four marks guide us on a common journey as companions on the journey synodoi. But let us take a step back and trace some of the developments of this word, both historically but most importantly, as my task dictates, from a Lutheran perspective. In the time we have together, I will first offer some distinctions in terminology Considering the dynamic and challenges of synodality, I will then examine Martin Luther's writing more closely, particularly his treatise, The Councils and the Church, from the year 1539, as well as his earlier treatise from 1523, named Concerning Ministry. In these writings, Luther outlines characteristics of councils and the role of priesthood of all believers. Based on these characteristics, I will then consider justification of the current move and finally spirit. So, my overview. It is always helpful to begin with distinctions in terminology, most notably for the reason that synodality as an expression is less common than terms such as collegia or concilia. The most important distinction to make is between synodality and collegiality. In our traditions, certainly in more recent history, collegiality has referred to a certain form of ecclesial government, whether that be reserved to a college of bishops or other forms of recognized church authority. Collegiality is recognized as an appropriate expression of oversight, episcopal or other. I quote, for the sake of the unity of the church extending beyond the diocese. This quote comes from the Lutheran, Joint Lutheran Catholic Commission report, The Apostasy of the Church. In Lutheran churches, I quote again, this does in fact occur on the national level to a certain extent through the bishops, conferences, and joint synods, end of quote. However, national boundaries are also not to be determinative of the church so the, I quote, development of collegiality among Lutheran bishops beyond the national framework remains a challenge, end of quote. Synodality is therefore than a collegial exercise of ecclesial authority. It encompasses not only regional or national forms of governance, but also local and global. Synodality defines a dynamic of discernment active on all levels of church life. In this sense, it is much harder to distinguish, if at all, from what is meant by concilia. Concilia is the Latin translation of synodos. Luther himself does not use the term synodal, but writes extensively on councils and concilia characteristics. More to that later. This brief analysis of terms highlights a particular dynamic inherent in synodality. Not only does it describe a form of governance, of consultation, of decision-making on different levels of ecclesial life, 
but it directs the church towards the spiritual dimension of authority, found not in the exercise of power as in the world, but in discernment of the way, Jesus Christ, as continually revealed in history through the Holy Spirit. Synodality holds both the spiritual realm and the political realm in balance. And here to the Lutheran delegation, when Pope Francis today went off script to remind us of the moment of crisis to unfold. Disconnected. Connected. Speaking about caminare insieme, synodality. Of course, can create a certain tension. It is the strug struggle already in apostolic times between accustomed methods of governance and the disruption occasioned by the Spirit. It is the struggle between firmly held definitions of faith challenged by new paths being forged. Is this not what we see happening in Acts 15 and the Jerusalem Council? A debate had started concerning circumcision as a requirement for adherence to the community. Paul and Barnabas had been preaching among the Gentiles and converting many, placing no obligation concerning practices. A decision needed to be reached concerning practices in the nascent Christian community and a council was called. Does the action of Paul and Barnabas adhere to the firmly held tradition requiring circumcision to be fully member of the community, or was this long-held reference, this issue of identity, to be abandoned? Of course, we do not know all the details of this debate, but we know the conclusion. James, after listening carefully, decided that no additional burdens should be imposed on Gentile converts. He did, though, add that they should be instructed to avoid unclean foods, fornication, and anything associated with idols. This council has been sometimes considered the model council for the great ecumenical councils that would take place in the 4th and the 5th century. It has certain distinguishing factors, however, that I would like to highlight. First of all, we notice that this, that this council, though occasionally referred to as the first apostolic council, had more participants than simply the apostles. When Paul and Barnabas arrived in Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church that included the apostles, the elders, the believers, including those believers who insisted on circumcisions. This we read in Acts 15, 4 and 5. It was a gathering of the faithful. It was an assembly that listened and discerned together, allowing James, called as overseer, to make a decision that, I quote from our holy book, the Bible, seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. The heart of the decision was to proclaim the liberating grace of the gospel. It should also be noted and underlined that the argument Paul and Barabbas made, as well as Peter, was from the experience of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the faithful. But then we might be curious about James' additional ruling that the Gentile believers should nonetheless abstain from certain things. Luther notes that this decision, though no critical to the proclamation of the gospel, nor the most important aspect of this first council, nonetheless shows forth a deep pastoral concern. It is a decision made out of love, not to offend those weak in faith or those who still need to cling to certain assurances. We have, according to Luther, a two-part decision, one anchored in faith, the other motivated by love.
Finally, here in this account, we witness the challenge of synodality situated between the spiritual realm and the political realm. The challenge consists precisely in practicing a new form of governance, holding firm to the truth in the midst of continual change. Christ's death and resurrection, the Christ event, has brought forth new creation, which the Holy Spirit inaugurates and continually broadens and deepens within history, the eternal within the temporal, accomplishing God's act of reclaiming and reconciling all things to God's self. This truth, however, needs also to find a form that can direct and shape communal living, the faith community in its relationship to the world. This truth finds expressions in proclamation, confessing the freedom of the gospel, but also in provisional decisions that must continually be revisited in every generation, in every new context, in every new and conciliar, conciliar characteristics. Perhaps you are already able to recognize an aspect of the Lutheran approach to synodality always holding things dialectically together. Faith acting in love, always standing before God and before human beings. It is in this fundamental perspective that Martin Luther approaches the issue of synodality or as he puts it, conciliarity. Luther has what we might call a love hate relationship with council as a historical phenomenon. It is well noted that he continually maintained a hope that the Pope would call for a council to listen, to dialogue, to consider the proposals for reform. See, for instance, his address to the Christian nobility in 1520. He hoped for a council that would discern the movement of the Holy Spirit. At the same time, he was very leery about councils, noting in his famous address at the Diet of Worms that he does not trust popes and councils alone since, I quote, it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves, end of quote. I am bound, he stated, I quote, by the scriptures I have quoted and my conscience is captive to the words of God. In the last decade of his life, having given up hope that a council would be called and one in which he would actually be heard, Luther set, out, set about writing his magisterial reflection on the councils and the church. In his lengthy and sometimes rambling treatise, Luther defines ten characteristics of councils or we might say ten characteristics of synodality which I will briefly summarize, focusing on the heart of his argument rather than specifically on all ten characteristics. After analyzing the actions and decisions of the first four ecumenical councils, Nicaea, Constantinople, Ephesus, and Chalcedon, after praising and critiquing decisions made, Luther describes the main purpose of function or function of a council or a synodal process, I quote, a council has no power to establish new articles of faith, even though the Holy Spirit is present. Even the Apostolic Council in Jerusalem introduced nothing new in matters of faith, but rather held that which St. Peter concludes." End of quote. In other words, a synodal process of decision-making does not invent anything new regarding faith, but confesses God's justifying acts, the Christ event, 
and translate that act into understandable and relatable language. A council points to God's action in Christ. It points to an attempt to define God's act of reconciling all things, all humanity and creation. The flip side of this insistence on keeping true to the apostolic faith and witness of the gospel is the power, I quote, to suppress and to condemn new articles of faith, end quote, and do so in accordance with the scriptures and the ancient faith. Quote, just as the council of Nicaea, Nicaea condemned the new doctrine of Arius, end of quote. Here again, the church is called into the act of confessing in this time. It is to name and to condemn all those things which individuals, communities, even nations may add to the simple and plain message of the gospel. In recent history, such an exercise of discernment and action was taken against apartheid by the Lutheran World Federation vis-a-vis -vis certain member churches. When a particular ethnic group claims gospel fullness for itself and restricts participation in God's church based on skin color, such an addition to the gospel must be condemned. Luther's list of characteristics of a council develops this internal logic lifting up the ancient faith and condemning any additions that create extra requirements. Councils should, I quote Luther, confess and defend the ancient, ancient faith and not institute new articles of faith against the ancient faith, nor institute new good works against the old good works, but defend the old good works against the new good works, end of quote. Nor institute no new ceremonies, if they are oppressive, oppressive for the people, though certain ceremonies are necessary to regulate, such as maintaining certain days and places for the assembly to gather for worship and hear the preaching and receive the sacraments for praying, singing, praising, and thanking God. In his conclusion to, his, to this section on the councils, Luther describes councils as a court of law. However, they appeal not to humanly devised or implemented laws, but to the one holy Christian church. And that church is created by the word. It is the church, I quote, which preaches, believes, and confesses holy scripture, I end quotes. Councils, or the synodal way, is not afraid of judging but it does so according to the gospel. As such, it too is a form of proclamation for it attempts to express in communal discernment and decision-making the movement of the Holy Spirit here and now. For Luther, if councils are the great judges, then the pastors, teachers, parents are each in their own communities also stewards of the gospel. The conciliar way is the way of every faith community. In a rather humorous statement, Luther says that pastors, I quote, young, take young rascals and constantly train new people to become bishops and councils, end of quote. But more seriously, Luther, when he understands the task of a council to prune the large limbs from the tree that endanger its health, sees the pastor and teacher as those who plant and cultivate young trees and useful shrubs in the garden. He calls this, I quote, a pre precious office and task, and they are the church's richest jewels, for they preserve the church, the parishes and schools, small though they are, are eternal and useful councils. I quote the end of quote. The concilia or synodal way is first and foremost lived out on the level of the local faith community, even in every Christian home. 
in a Lutheran understanding, the Christian assembly has the right to judge doctrine. This possibility is, of course, rooted in the priesthood of all believers. Clearly, I cannot dive into all the dimensions of the priesthood of all believers in Luther theology, given our time frame. But I do wish to develop the intrinsic connection between the priesthood of all believers and the Catholic understanding, as also expressed by Pope Francis of the sensus fidei. The synodal way, alive in every Christian assembly, is founded on baptism. In baptism, every believer has received the Holy Spirit and the Spirit's gifts. As Luther, as Luther states in the large catechism, baptism promises and brings, I quote, victory over death and the devil, forgiveness of sin, God's grace, the entire Christ and the Holy Spirit with the Spirit's gifts, end of quote. These gifts of the Holy Spirit, I quote, equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. End of quote from Ephesians. Every Christian is called to grow in the gifts of the Spirit for the building up of communion the body of Christ. Every Christian is called to discern the gift of the Spirit in others, leading to unity of faith, as well as growth in communion. Every Christian is equipped to walk together on this way ever deeper into communion, living out and witnessing to God's act of reconciliation. As noted at the beginning of this lecture, synodality encompasses both the spiritual and the political realms. Therefore, catechesis and discernment are necessary. Discerning the way, this growth in communion requires guidance. It requires a call at ministry who are both stewards of word and sacrament and teachers. Education was a central agenda item of the Reformation. The faithful may be promised and given God, the entire Christ, Christ, and the Holy Spirit will all the Spirit's gifts, but that gift must be nurtured, exercised, encouraged, allowing it to grow and to be active. One of the most significant gifts of the Reformation is precisely catechesis, and Luther's own small and large catechism meant for the faithful and for the pastors to be studied, studied daily. The already referred Lutheran Catholic document report on apostolicity says, I quote, Lutheran doctrine locates the ministry of teaching primarily in the local congregation for which ministers are properly called and ordained to teach publicly and administer the sacraments. Linked to sound exegesis and theological reflection the teaching office is a necessary component of a church life by which individuals become responsible in the public life of the church for transmitting the gospel by which the priesthood of all believers is built up." End of quote. Through education and study, through the exercise of faith in the midst of the Christian assembly, the sensus fidei is exercised in all the baptized. All are called into witness and responsibility in the life of the church, women, men, and those who identify differently. There is no distinction made in the promises of baptism. The document of the International Theological Commission of the Roman Catholic Church, Synodality in the Life and Mission of the Church, states it in this way, I quote, the anointing of the Holy Spirit is manifested in the sensus fidei of the faithful. In all the baptized, from first to last, the sanctifying power of the Spirit is at work, impelling us to evangelization." End of quote. At the joint commemoration of the Reformation in Lund, Sweden, 2016, 
Pope Francis called attention to the census fidei and challenged all of us to be attentive to the vocation of the faithful. I quote Pope Francis, we ought to recognize with the same honesty and love that our division distanced us from the primordial intuition of God's people who naturally yearn to be one and that, is, was, and that it was perpetuated historically by the powerful of this world rather than the faithful people, which always and everywhere needs to be guided surely and lovingly by its good shepherd. I close quotes. The Christian assembly, the gathering of the faithful around word and sacrament is constituted first and foremost by the people of God who naturally yearn to be one. Here, in the liturgy of word and sacrament, faith is exercised as it is explained in the Lutheran Confessional Writings, Article 24 of the Augsburg Confession. This exercise of faith leads the assembly into prayer and, to quote Dietrich Bonhoeffer's important addition, prayer and action. It is noteworthy that Luther concludes his treatise on the councils and the church by a description of church for church is the community of the baptized who practice certain marks that identify them as church in contrast to a secular or political organization. The ultimate discernment of the spirit's presence and activity is through the practice of these marks, preaching, baptism, holy communion, the office of the keys, ministry, prayer and thanksgiving and bearing the suffering of the neighbor. We find these same marks already presented in an earlier treatise by Luther concerning ministry from 1523. There, however, the final or seventh mark is different. In the earlier treatise, the seventh and last function or mark of a Christian assembly is to judge and pass on doctrines. It is, if you will, the call of the Christian assembly to be immersed in God's word and one at the Eucharistic table that then guides lively conversation, debate, dialogue, discernment on the urgent gospel in any given context. Every faith community is challenged by this baptismal call to live out a synodal way. Let me go deeper into justification as measure or touchstone. The synodal way recognizes the fullness of faith of all the baptized. It seeks to continually discern and embody the communion already given by God in Christ Jesus, engaging a way of reconciliation that reaches out to all humanity and creation. Yes, already in the 16th century, Martin Luther was uplifting this fullness of faith found as he described it not only in the spiritual state, but in all the baptized. In fact, one might even make the claim that the synodal way is at the heart of the Reformation, though here too the ideal is sometimes harder to put into practice than expected. Since a Christian assembly is called together around word and sacrament, prayer, dialogue, discernment and decision-making view of proclamation, addressing pastoral needs and care for the poor. What criterion guides such discernment and decision-making? How does a Christian assembly judge and pass on doctrines? In his treatise on the councils and the church, Luther points out that the principal criterion is the gospel, God's justifying and reconciling act in Jesus Christ. The councils cannot add anything to it, nor take anything away from it. In our ecumenical journey, our communions have also affirmed this criterion. In the joint declaration on the doctrine of justification, we have agreed in paragraph 18 that, I quote, the doctrine of justification is more than just one part of a Christian doctrine. It stands in an essential relation to all truths of faith, which are to be seen as internally related to each other. 
It is an indispensable criterion which constantly serves to orient all the teachings and practice of our churches to Christ." End of quote. And in the annex, paragraph three, we add, the doctrine of justification is measure or touchstone for the Christian faith. No teaching may contradict this criterion. End of quote. And this agreement is, as I mentioned in my opening word, a consensus between five world communions. We need not look further than to this simple yet all-encompassing gospel reality. Justification serves as this touchstone, touchstone for discernment. Confronted with any question of discernment, perhaps the question is then, how is the gospel translated in this particular situation? How do we translate God's desire of life abundant for all? God's intent that the church embodies a communion that breaks down all the barriers and division we so quickly create? Well, what will lead to the church becoming, in the words of John Paul II, the, I quote, home and school of communion, end of quote. An immediate question that confronts our communions is the application of this criterion or touch, touchstone to our ecclesial practices and teaching as called for in the joint declaration. In a Lutheran perspective, if conciliarity or the synodal way is to continually discern and confess God's gift and power of life and renewal in every situation, in every time, in and out of season, if conciliarity or the synodal way is to discern and dismantle all that impedes and hinders communion, then the synodal way clearly challenges, challenges us to find a new language for church. How does justification by faith alone impact our ecclesiologies? In what ways will we be able to grow in communion, listening to the instinct of faith in the people of God who yearn to be one and who, as we already know, gather together even to celebrate the Eucharist? Engaging a synodal way as a consequence of our consensus and justification means holding on to that which is true, which is true through all time. God's word and understanding the professionality of all reference points of faith. It means listening to each other, analyzing, discerning the action of the Holy Spirit, and in this way also providing some framework for the faithful in their commitment and yearning for unity. I end with reflections on synodality a spiritual discipline at the heart of the ecumenical movement. The synodal way is a mighty challenge. It is a spiritual challenge. It is discipleship not only at the heart of our ecclesial structures and identities, but a spiritual discipline that is at the heart of the ecumenical movement. I can speak about the Lutheran World Federation and its own process around Lutheran identity and a theology of communion. What does it mean to be a communion? Where does decision-making take place in a global communion and where are boundaries for such a decision? Isn't the acceptance of a church into membership formal and institutional as it may be, if seen organizationally, already a deeply theological decision as it identifies unity in the proclamation of the Doctrina Evangelii and at the table of the Lord? As it has happened in the past to us Lutherans, we are already much more than what we seem to be ready to express in our constitution and our foundational documents. To live ever deeper into the gift of communion also means taking responsibility for one another. It means to accept the discipline of listening to other member churches in the communion, to carry with them their struggles and burdens. The discipline is a simple one. It means not putting oneself or one's own ecclesial identity at the center, but in dialogue and in solidarity. 
in the LWF, the question of communion asks not only this profound spiritual question, but and then also the political question about ecclesial structures and what forms of governance can best take into account both the instinct of faith, the spirit-filled discernment and decisions of one member and the bound conscience, conscience of another. The church in its essence is the sign of unity. It is communion that God has given in the midst of humanity that today is fragmented, exclusionary, adversarial, isol isolationist. The synodal way engages the churches together as a sign of hope in the midst of political and social tension. The church can model such dialogue and hope. The synodal way is therefore a prophetic witness in our times of fragmentation. Yet living from hope as church and as individuals entails two additional marks that I would like to offer and highlight here. Perhaps they are already the subtext of Luther's seventh mark from the 1539 treaties bearing the neighbor's cross, vulnerability. For those who are on the way, there is always a deep awareness of one's own vulnerability. If you want to be on the way, caminare insieme, more so with others, you leave your space of safety and comfort and make yourself vulnerable together with those journeying with you. Synodality as a spiritual discipline and ecumenical practice entails the acknowledgement of one's and the other's vulnerability. Otherwise, we are not on the way. The other mark I want to offer is solidarity, or let me push it further, hospitality. If you're on the way, and because of that profound sense of your own vulnerability, you will depend more and more on others as well as offer solidarity in every situation in which you are able to do so. We cannot be companions on the journey without a deep reliance on the hospitality of others arising out of a shared understanding and commitment to synodality. The synodal way, therefore, comes with its own ethos of inter interdependence and mutuality which opens up avenues for the sharing of the gifts of Christ as a gift and mutual recognition of oneness on the way and in our searching for unity. In the realm of Lutheran and Catholic collaboration, the declaration of intent signed between Caritas Internationalis and LWF World Service during the joint commemoration of the Reformation, and this very morning in a gathering at the office of the PCPCU, lifted up again with further commitments to pastoral ecumenism in an example where, as churches, we engage not only in dialogue but action. In our commitment to the poor and the marginalized and the suffering in this world, as we listen and learn from them, we as individuals, but also as churches, are transformed in that encounter. Spaces of communion are opened that then open up spaces of dialogue. And as we listen ever more carefully to the instinct of faith, to the priesthood of all believers, and to the yearning for peace and reconciliation among all peoples, our doctrinal dialogue will be transformed. Let us continue, therefore, to walk on this way together, caminare insieme, in communion, bearing one another's burdens and hopes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for reminding us that in the basis of the gospel of Luther and of the experience of the Lutheran World Federation, the synodal exercise 
implies uh, being dialectically together. And being dialectically together uh, by exercising a dynamic discernment that connect all the believers in unity of faith and help them also to deepen the faith, having the gospel as a criteria. That was really very important to be heard, and it is important for us to, re to, to reflect about. Now, we will have some uh, uh, occasion to have some questions. Uh, you are most welcome to address uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Junger. Please show hands because we need to have the microphone in order to have also the question being transmitted in uh, streaming. I have no the jokes of Sister Alford, so <laughs> I know the beautiful language. So may I just start by asking something about Lutherans have the local congregation, and this local congregation in some ways favors the synodical way. What are the challenges you will identify in that synodical way, in that exercise of discernment together? Well, first of all, I believe there is an external challenge uh, which is posed by the times in which we live. Um, I think in history there are times where people uh, are seeking to come together. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe uh, after Second World War, for instance, was such a time where people were really trying, communities, states, governments were trying to push, pull together in order to present a very powerful never again should the demon of violence and destruction uh, ravage hu the human family and the world. This is not the dynamic in which we are today. Uh, I sense in these times um, we are marked by uh, uh, strong centrifugal forces uh, bringing us apart, taking us apart so the, the challenge of being formed as a community in Christ, focusing on the centripetal force of baptism as opposed to the centrifugal forces getting hold of us, seems to be more difficult, I believe, than in other times. So I believe there is an external factor, polarization, fragmentation, which we see not only around us, but creeping deeply into our communities and churches. Mm -hmm. It is becoming harder to lift up the power of baptism as a centripetal force that brings us together. This is my perception. Theologically, uh, of course, uh, the, the question we deal with uh, as Lutherans at a local, national, regional, and global level is again a dialectic tension which we have not yet fully resolved, which is the autonomy mm -hmm. of the body and the accountability of these bodies called into a, a common journey and a common witness in this world. So at times there is a strong emphasis on the autonomy of decision making at different levels, and yet we are church. And yet we are a communion of churches. How do we spell that out? How do we live that out in concrete terms? And I believe this is one of the beautiful fields uh, which we have in front of us as a global Lutheran communion um, to live deeper into and to um, express in ever clearer ways. Please. 
Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this lecture, which was it's so profound. Um, okay. You mentioned synodical ideas as both spiritual and political. So if I may, I want to ask you a little bit about the political side of that and the witness that it offers in the world. The most radical idea central to the gospel is, is the radical equality of all people. Sorry. The, yeah. the radical equality of all people before the throne of God. That idea begins to have power in Luther's moment with the rise of the idea of the nation state and the notion that people ought to have a voice in the government of civil affairs. My own church, which emerges in the United States, coming out of the Anglican tradition, takes that idea forward in the governance of the church by giving the people a voice and a vote in discerning the theological direction of the church. Today, we live in a moment in which those ideas themselves are now called into question. And it appears as though the rising powers are those that deny the dignity of individual humans and hold over and against that the power of the state, authoritarianism. What is the witness of synodality in this moment when democratic government itself seems to be challenged? Well, there are many dimensions in what you, what you presented. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I think, first of all, uh, as you mentioned, this radical message um, uh, that we receive, um, uh, we read it already in the Gospels that uh, the unconditional um, gift of Christ to humankind uh, is always met by humankind by a yes but. Uh, we always would have objections uh, to God's radical uh, gift of Christ. Uh, we read it in the Gospels. Uh, not on that day, not to that person, not this, no that. Yes but. So I believe there is something in us um, which uh, needs to be converted uh, by the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and we cannot but pray for that conversion every day, the daily baptism of which Luther spoke. On, on your question, um, I would also agree that um, uh, we are not living in an easy time when it comes to questions like participation, inclusion, and as you pointed out also, democracy. Um, you refer to that explicitly, seems to be more on a, on a shaky ground. I believe uh, it is an expression of um, at a time of turmoil where, let me use that language, power is at grabs, uh, and um, uh, where, where that question of how power is going to be negotiated in the time to come is uh, a, a it's, it's an urgent question uh, to be resolving. I believe that, as I said in a one line uh, of my presentation today, that um, synodality, if exercised with all the limitations, uh, again here, I'm so deeply grateful for a Lutheran theology that helps us to think of the human being as a simul, simul justus et peccator. Uh, we are on our way as we try to create the way of caminare insieme. We are, we are ourselves on our way. But I still believe that that attempt to be on a way of sharing and negotiating power and decision as churches can represent a very powerful prophetic sign we should be offering that prophetic sign of conversation, of discernment, of including in view of discerning the spirit and the, the, the core of the gospel. So um, 
my call to those churches where I can call upon, uh, which is LWF member churches, uh, is always um, uh, let not go. Uh, that exercise of uh, sharing, of including, of making those decisions together. But the context is difficult, uh, I agree. And uh, I also believe, uh, nurtured by faith, we have uh, something to offer a prophetic witness of doing it in a different way, understanding and acknowledging our own brokenness as we try to do that. Thank you, Dr. Younger, for, for uh, the lecture this evening. Um, as Sister Helen referred to, uh, in her introduction, um, this is the beginning of, of a, a three-year synodal process for the Catholic Church, and um, given the importance of and the connection between synodality and ecumenism, we, we who work in ecumenism see this as a, as a great opportunity uh, for, for progress in, in, in our ecumenical journey, um, and the need for the Catholic Church to uh, show within herself um, synodal processes which are credible to her ecumenical partners. Um, so I suppose I wonder if I can ask you um, what your own hopes perhaps for uh, the synodal process that the Catholic Church is embarking on might be and, and what, what uh, makes uh, a synodal process uh, credible. Thank you. Um, I believe that, uh, that um, a synodical process, um, as it is being developed and unfolding in, in the Catholic Church, uh, needs to grow out or needs to grow from a trajectory. Uh, and I think this is what uh, uh, Pope Francis is trying to do with also giving time um, um, so, um, I, I believe it would be very difficult, I sense, for if, if the synodical way or, the, or the, the process in which you are um, would be implemented in a, in a way that does not take into account the trajectory. And, well, we read there is a huge trajectory there on which to pick, you know, and, and which to include. Um, I think one of the basic principles of uh, synodality uh, for it to achieve, and here I'm not giving advice, I'm just reflecting on how we would do that and have to do that, is to be as inclusive as possible. Uh, if it is caminare insieme, uh, it is caminare insieme, and it needs to include. Um, so I, I guess this is, this is my hope. Um, and uh, when it comes to, to the own process of the Catholic Church, which we observe uh, and follow and, and pray for. Thank you very much. I think we are coming to the end. Um, in 2025, we are going to celebrate the Council of Nicaea. Mm -hmm. And I must say that for the Lutheran faith and for the Catholics, Nicaea is a milestone in our faith and we hope also that on that occasion we will be able also to prepare together for that, working together towards a renewal of our faith in a fragmented world, trying not only to walk together but also to invite the world to walk with us because they recognize Christ and they recognized again the gospel. And I think this is something that Catholics will love to hear from the Lutherans, but Lutherans also will hear, would love to hear from Catholics. And if we do together, perhaps in 2025, we will also celebrate something that is important for all of us. I just like to thank you very much to being with us this evening and thank you all so those who were following in the streaming uh, please uh, continue